We are asked to determine whether the integral is convergent or divergent, and we notice that the upper bound is infinity. And this is going to make this what we call an improper integral. And the first thing you have to do when evaluating an improper integral is replace infinity with a variable. It's typically t is chosen. And you can do that so long as you take the limit as t approaches infinity. And that way the problem remains unchanged. And then after making that little adjustment to the problem, the next thing you have to do is actually figure out the integral. So typically we take an aside and we try to evaluate the integral of the expression given in the problem. Now in this case we have the denominator as v squared plus 8v minus 9. We actually want to factor that expression. This will make the integration a little bit easier. And when factoring the v squared decomposes into v times v. We need two numbers of course that add to make 8 but also multiply to make negative 9. And perhaps plus 9 and minus 1 would work because those certainly add to make 8. 8, but they also multiply to make negative 9. Now, what we have here is actually a case of partial fractions. You probably learned in a previous section or two that when you have a couple of factors in the denominator, you have to evaluate that by using partial fractions. So we actually have to kind of take another aside and rewrite the expression. Now, notice there is a 1 in the numerator here. So what we're going to do is just take 1 over these two factors and we're going to decompose them into partial fractions. Notice we're not integrating right now. So we're just trying to rewrite the expression and then we'll go back and actually integrate it. Now, these two factors are what we call distinct linear factors. They are distinct because they're different. V plus nine is different than V minus one. And they're linear because their variable is raised to the power of one. So we have V to the one plus nine and V to the one minus one. So distinct linear factors can be decomposed into a constant over the first factor plus another constant over the second factor. And then what we need to do to progress through this is find a common denominator. So for example, the first denominator is missing a factor of v minus one. So we'll multiply the bottom as well as the top by v minus one. The next denominator is missing the factor of v plus nine. So we'll multiply bottom and top by v plus nine. Now, once you establish the common denominator, it's easiest to just go ahead and cancel out the common denominator. And that way we can set the numerators equal. So we have one is equal to V minus one multiplied by A plus B times V plus nine. Now there is a bit of a shortcut method we can take here to figuring out the values of A and B. Notice if we let V equal negative nine, something very advantageous will take place. If we plug negative nine in for this V, we'll have negative nine plus nine, which is zero, and B times zero, of course, is zero. So that's gonna actually wipe out this term right here. And we would be left with one equals negative nine minus one times A. Negative nine minus one is negative 10 times A. We can see when solving that A is going to equal negative one tenth. So that was pretty handy. We can do another trick to figure out the value of b, watch what happens if we let v equal one. Because then we have, if we plug one in for this v, one minus one is zero, zero times a is zero, so that knocks out this term. And therefore we could just write one equals b multiplied by one plus nine. You finish solving this out, you're going to get one tenth is equal to b. So we have the values of a and b, and that's going to allow us to rewrite our expression and we can also begin to integrate it. So recall that we originally had one over V plus nine times V minus one, and then we had set that equal to A over V plus nine, but we now know that A is negative one tenth. And then we did plus B over V minus one, but B is positive one tenth. So that's how we can rewrite that partial fraction or that expression using partial fractions, excuse me. So now we can actually integrate. So we're gonna go ahead and we're going to integrate the one over V plus nine times V minus one with respect to V. This will equal the integral of negative one tenth over V plus nine plus positive one tenth over V minus one. And that is all with respect to V. Now for the first integral, 
We can actually factor out the negative one tenth, so we would have negative one tenth integral of one over v plus nine dv, plus the second integral, factor out the positive one tenth, and then you'll have integral of one over v minus one dv. Both of these can be evaluated using a u substitution, but there's a bit of a shortcut that you often encounter in these types of problems, and here it is. Whenever you have, let's say, one over your variable plus or minus a constant, and you want to integrate that with respect to v, without going through the u substitution, you'll always end up with the natural log, the absolute value of v plus your constant. So that's just a nice little shortcut that you might want to keep in mind. By applying that shortcut, we would get negative one tenth ln absolute value of v plus nine plus one tenth ln absolute value of v minus one. So we have finally computed the integral, but we're not done. We have to go back and remember that we had bounds. We had a lower bound of two and an upper bound of t. So you have to go back now and put the bounds on. So why don't we do that? We'll copy our expression here, and then we'll put the bounds on. And oh my goodness, I've already forgotten them. Two to t, all right. So we're gonna evaluate this from two to t. Don't forget, of course, that the limit as t approaches infinity was part of this problem. So we'll go ahead and we'll plug in the upper bound first. So here we go, we're gonna have the limit as t approaches infinity, and we'll just plug t in for all the variables. So negative one tenth ln of t plus nine plus one tenth ln absolute value of t minus one. And then we have to subtract what we'll get by plugging in the lower bound of two. So it gets a little messy here. You're gonna have negative one tenth natural log. Now, if I plug two in here, two plus nine is 11. So let's just call that ln of 11. And then you have plus one tenth ln and then two minus one is one, so ln of one. Okay, so far so good. Now we just have to clean this up a little bit. Notice the ln of one is just zero, so this term over here is gonna drop out of the equation. And then what I think we need to do here is factor out a negative one tenth. The, the, the improper integrals that involve lns are a little bit a little bit tricky here, because you might be tempted to just go ahead and plug infinity in, but if you did that, you'd have the ln of infinity plus the ln of infinity. You'd have infinity plus infinity. You would think that that's equal to infinity, and then you might say that the integral was divergent in that case. But watch what happens if we factor out the negative one-tenth. So that will leave us with the natural log of absolute value of t plus nine, and then this will give us minus the natural log of the absolute value of t minus one. I think I factored that correctly because negative one tenth multiplied by that negative one right there would give me positive one tenth. Okay, well done. So we have that and then we still have the result over here. Now this minus and this minus are gonna make a plus. So you'll have plus one tenth natural log of 11. Now let's consider log properties. We have a logarithm minus a logarithm. We recall from pre-calculus that that can be re-expressed as a quotient, as a division problem. So you'll actually have negative one-tenth times the natural log of t plus nine over t minus one, like that. Notice we don't need the absolute values here because t is approaching positive infinity, so it's guaranteed to be positive. So if you plugged infinity in, you're gonna have infinity in the numerator over infinity in the denominator. We recall that when you have infinity over infinity, you have to use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule applies whenever you have infinity over infinity in your limit. So here we go, we're gonna do L'Hopital's rule. We'll write LH just to indicate that we're executing that rule. And it's a very simple rule. We just take the derivative of the numerator, which is one, and the derivative of the denominator, which is also one. And something actually surprising happens here because you end up with the natural log of one. We stated earlier that the natural log of one is zero. So this entire term here disappears, it goes to zero. Therefore, we no longer need the limit because there's no longer the variable t in our answer. So we're actually just left with one tenth ln of 11. And since that is a finite quantity, this limit is indeed convergent. And again, notice if we didn't combine the natural logs into a quotient, we might have mistakenly thought we were going to have infinity plus 
infinity. In fact, now that I look at it, this actually would have been negative infinity over here because of that negative sign. Regardless, it would have been difficult to interpret. So we definitely had to approach it by combining the natural logs together.